We are very lucky because we have Laurie Locascio joining us digitally from the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the, um, at the, uh, and she's also a uh, state secretary um, for the same subject at the state Depa U.S. Department of Commerce. Sorry, I'm getting confused. There she is. Hello, Laurie, and she's going to introduce us into the. Um, U.S. standardization strategy or a specific aspect of it, which looks into critical and emerging technologies. And then I'm going to have an, a panel about this with members from Germany, from the EU, etc., so we can c discuss coordination um, and uh, how to work together. Laurie, welcome digitally here to Berlin. We are very uh, happy to have you and we're uh, very curious to hear what you have to say about the U.S. strategy uh, on standardization. Well, thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to join you. You can hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, yeah, good afternoon. And uh, I, I do wish I could be there in person, uh, but my colleague, Dr. Janie Morrow, is there to join you in person. She's my lead advisor on standards policy, and she'll be able to answer questions there after the panel discussion. Um, but I really enjoyed seeing the end of that, this discussion on um, uh, the, this last discussion. I probably have a few questions to tee up uh, that can follow. Um, so I'm pleased to share a few words about the newly released U.S. government national standards strategy for critical and emerging technology, uh, as well as highlight some of the important contributions that NIST has made that advance a greener economy. Um, the future of international standards development, of course, is evolving and accelerating, especially for critical and emerging technologies. The rapid pace of technology innovation, coupled with the urgent global challenges like, like climate change, prevent, really presents new challenges for international standards development and presents new challenges for all of our economies. And so it's therefore a top priority for, for us at NIST and at the U.S. Department of Commerce and the U.S. government as a whole that we work very closely with organizations like OECD to assist our private sectors in sustaining standards development across a broad range of critical and emerging industries. And I cannot overstate the importance of coordination and cooperation amongst international partners to achieve shared goals. Now, um, my title is Director of NIST and Undersecretary of Commerce for Standards and Technology. And I'm especially proud of how my organization, NIST, supports the U.S. private sector-led standard system as we carry out the NIST mission to ensure U.S. economic security. Um, one example of this work can be seen in the area of sustainable manufacturing practices with improved chemical transformations and with renewable energy inputs, including photo and electrochemical processes, new standards, definitions, and certifications are needed to accurately measure and validate these greener transactions. And likewise, for the circular economy, the development of timely standards and certified values for recovered material are essential to setting the pace for greener tra transactions really across all economies by accelerating the recovery of post-use resources. Now for NIST, it's clear that critical and emerging technologies to support greener transactions must they themselves be supported by technically sound measurements and international standards. Now, according to the US Department of Commerce uh, International Trade Administration, 93% of global trade is, in or is really impacted by international standards. And so for NIST, our mission is very clear. We have standards in our middle name. Um, now, as you all know, the European Union, the People's Republic of China, and the United States have all recognized the importance of international standards and published their own strategies. And combined, it really reflects a very simple reality that international standards are essential to the innovation that is needed to solve urgent global challenges like climate change. Now, the newly released U.S. government national standards strategy for critical and emerging technology, I know that's a, it's a mouthful, 
is, is really part of a broad emphasis across the U.S. government to strengthen U.S. competitiveness and innovation. And it's meant to enhance and focus the U.S. government's approach um, by supporting a private sector-led system while ensuring U.S. engagement on the international stage. Now, there are eight critical areas listed in the standard strategy as essential for U.S. competitiveness and national security. And I would point out that this list is not exhaustive and we do expect it to evolve over time if this is to be a living document, and it is. Um, now, one of the eight areas listed is clean energy, energy generation storage. Additionally, carbon capture, re removal, utilization, and storage are recognized as a specific technical application that will have a lasting impact on our economy. Um, strong collaboration is required to build upon evolving standards for CO2 storage and to, to, to develop new standards for carbon measurement and monitoring and verification. Now, I also wanted to mention a few other areas of focus in the strategy that have potential impacts on green tech and where NIST will play a, a very important role, central role for governments in the United States. And these include AI and machine learning that I know will be discussed here today. Um, they include biotechnology and include semiconductors. Now, many of you know or some of you know that NIST is leading the bulk of the efforts in the United States related to the implementation of the Chips for America Act. Uh, NIST is in charge of a $50 billion effort to restore semiconductor manufacturing and R&D. Um, now, the need for a robust standard strategy really encompasses all the needs of all of these industries. And it became clear because our nation faces new challenges in, in new and emerging markets. Um, the pace of technology development is rapidly accelerating. And standards development activities are fundamental to supporting these new and emerging markets. The U.S. strategy illustrates, I think, a very proactive vision that builds on what made the U.S. approach to standards successful for decades and decades. And it ensures that the United States is effectively positioned to address future challenges in international standards development. Um, here, you know, I think it's really important that to stress that the strategy does not aim to exclude any country or any participant from developing international standards. Um, this is a very important point that I feel I need to emphasize over and over. And it is also important that our like-minded partners and allies share this vision and that we do not want to exclude U.S. stakeholders from, from your respective strategies. Um, if that's possible, that would be really important, I think, to make sure that we're all running in the same direction. And so, um, so the idea of keeping people away from the table, I think, is not conducive to really where we want to go together. Now, to date, the inclusive U.S. approach in developing standards has resulted in standards that are technically sound and favorable to our domestic stakeholders and our allies and like-minded partners, and also ensure access to global markets. Um, global markets and global economies have benefited greatly from this approach, and we really want to continue in the United States that approach. Now, faced with new challenges, it is essential that we all remain fully engaged and promote the best possible technical solutions that really benefit everyone. And, and again, I wanna emphasize that we would like to do this by working together. Now we maintain that standards should always be developed in accordance with the World Trade Organization's Technical Barrier to Trade Committee decision that articulates principles of transparency, openness, impartiality, and consensus, effectiveness, and relevance, and coherence. Um, Dr. Janie Morrow, who again is in the room, was just at the technical at the, T the TBT committee meeting in Geneva to share more about our strategy and our interest in working together to sustain these principles in the governance of standards development efforts across the world. 
Now, I'm excited that NIST will lead the implementation of this new strategy on behalf of the entire U.S. government. As director of NIST, um, I have directed my team to coordinate across the U.S. Department of Commerce and really in, across all agencies in the government to strengthen our involvement in standards development efforts um, and ensure that the whole will be greater than the sum of its parts. Now, in keeping with the NIST tradition, this implementation will be accomplished from beginning to end with private sector stakeholder engagement as a core value. Um, sometimes they call NIST Industries National Lab, and we got that moniker for a good reason, because we are trusted by industry and we work very closely with them to try to make sure that we understand their needs. Um, and we look forward to working alongside the private sector and, and with our international partners as we move forward together in renewing our commitment to WTO TBT principles. Uh, we welcome your thoughts on the implementation in this, in this important strategy for the United States. And in the coming weeks, NIST is going to be issuing a request for information in the form of a federal register notice. And in that notice, we are asking stakeholders to share wisdom and insights on how to remove barriers for more effective engagement in standards development. Um, NIST is working very closely with the American National Standards Institute, ANSI. Uh, we're working with standards development organizations across the globe and industry leaders to conduct stakeholder events. And we're being very open about this, and you can find more information on NIST efforts at our website, standards.gov. Uh, I thank you for the opportunity to share more about this work and, and really, again, welcome your input on how we can work together to drive technology and innovation and international standards. And to end, I, you know, I just wanted to mention a few challenges that we are facing um, that are food for thought. First, the U.S. standards innovation system is a bottom-up system that's led by the private sector. We support that. Um, and sustaining this system is, is critical to sustaining the global innovation ecosystem. Uh, standards are not impediments to innovation. Sometimes people think they are. Um, but they're really essential to our ability to drive innovation globally. And they sit at the nexus of R&D and implementation. Um, you know, one of the things that I love about the U.S. standard strategy, it really does emphasize that R&D is critical to feed into standards development. And that's really the number one point in, in the standard strategy or the first point in the standard strategy. Um, but with this in mind, you know, how do we work together to demonstrate and communicate this unique role? And, and how do we measure the efficacy and resilience of the system, the standard system as a whole across the globe. Um, and then, you know, another issue that I'd really like to bring up is, are there better ways that the United States and the EU can coordinate our activities in standards policy and parallel R&D investments for critical and emerging technologies, and in particular, renewable en energy solutions? Now, there is a lot of work to be done. I look forward to, to speaking with you. And again, I really do wish I was in the room to have these conversations, but I look forward to receiving a report on opportunities for further collaboration when Dr. Morrow returns to the States. So thank you so much for the opportunity to speak with you today. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Director Lukashu, for this uh, wonderful introduction and to the rationale uh, for the uh, U.S. standardization strategy on emerging technologies and also for this wonderful call for uh, cooperation and coordination. And I think we can uh, perhaps deliver some of this uh, even now uh, with our panel, uh, which is partly so we have a hybrid conference. Uh, some people will join us digitally. One is uh, Gwen Kozigu from the European Commission. He's Director General uh, of the uh, Directorate GROW and I think uh, responsible in this uh, role for the EU standardization uh, policy. So we can bring up uh, some of your questions um, right now or in a moment. Uh, Thomas Zielke of the uh, uh, German Ministry of Economy and Climate Action is going to um, 
join us, join me here physically uh, on the panel, and also Knut Blind, who is a uh, professor at the Technical University uh, of Berlin, and also, please have a seat, uh, sit right next to me, um, uh, here in Berlin, and of the Fra Fraunhofer Easy Institute, and he is a living proof, uh, Laurie, to what you just said, that standards are not hindering, um, uh, are not hindering um, innovation, but they are actually fur furthering them. And um, I think um, Nigel Corey is also joining uh, digitally from the United States, and um, I, he's uh, from the. Um, I'm sorry, but. <laughs> Here, sorry, I'm, I got uh, confused with my notes. Uh, this is not good. He's an associate director of trade policy and information technology at the uh, innovation fi um, uh, inf at the Founda information technology and innovation foundation, and he has written extensively also about standards. So it's very good to have you here, and thanks for joining us digitally. And I think uh, the way I would like to start is actually. Um, well, uh, with you, Gwen, because uh, Laurie at the end of her speech brought up one important question, which is about how can the EU and the US cooperate better, better in particular on their standardization uh, strategies for emerging technologies. So the EU, like the US, has just come up with a new uh, standardization uh, strategy. So perhaps you give a, can give us some insights into what you, what the EU is trying to achieve achieve with its uh, standardization strategy uh, and also perhaps answer a little bit or pick up on the uh, cooperation question. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm glad to be with you, although it's virtual, uh, but um, I'm very glad to be participating in that. So uh, we actually issued our strategy uh, back in February last year. So we went a bit earlier than our American friends. Um, there, and if I want to cut a long, long story short, I would say we've got four main areas uh, which we point out. The first one, to be schematic, is internal. So uh, uh, improve our system, put oil, put oil in the engine, get standards faster, uh, etc. Uh, still internal, also to have to complete the bottom of approach, which is basically determining the standardization needs. Uh, by standardizers, continuing with the bottom up, but complementing it with uh, what we call the top down approach, which is basically integrate our policy priorities as well, uh, so that the standardization work can be issued. And that's very, very important in a situation where we've got the green digital transition and also uh, the resilience priority that was actually underlined both with COVID and what, and what we experienced with the Russian aggression against Ukraine. So that's basically to make sure that these priorities are also integrated in our work programs, uh, in our priorities for standardization. So better link between policy and, 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 and uh, standardization. Uh, there were also a few governance issues that we wanted to sort out, uh, and that's also what the strategy deals with. So that's for the internal part. The second axe is interna the international dimension, where traditionally we've been very active but there are new partners who are becoming extremely active as well. Uh, and we, 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 sh we are very happy that people get involved in international standardization, but sometimes the values are not exactly the same, as I would say. And therefore, uh, the need for in more intensive cooperation with like-minded partners like the US, like Japan, uh, is important. And that's actually what we've already uh, seen in concretely in the work we do on standardization within the Trade and Technology Council uh, that the EU and the US actually launched uh, last year. Um, and we, we have the same type of process, not the TTC, but same type of cooperation with the, the Japanese colleagues as well. Um, the third avenue is, and actually uh, that's you find it as well in the US strategy is about education and skills uh, in, the, in the EU. We've got a particular issue is that we've got a very wide standardizers community. Uh, I was told once that uh, we could fill the Camp Nou, the famous soccer, soccer stadium in Barcelona uh, with, this, with standardizers only. 
the only problem is that the standardizing community is aging and it's very male. So we want to make particular efforts to sensitize our young citizens, our young engineers, our young lawyers, uh, and male and female, so that they can actually uh, join the standardization community and, uh, and actually provide the substitution for the people who will progressively retire. And the fourth, uh, the fourth element is, of course, better link. And that was also mentioned by Laurie between research and standardization. So to integrate the standardization dimension uh, uh, much earlier than we tended to do uh, in the research and innovation work. Um, I remember having launched the European Batteries Initiative, and uh, we realized that since we want a sustainable batteries value chain, we realized two years after we launched the initiative that standards would be needed in order to ensure that batteries uh, uh, would be would actually correspond to the sustainability criteria. But I would say two, two years lost. So when we launched the hydrogen initiative, actually it's a mistake. We we try to we try to avoid trying to work on lessons learned. So that's basically what we intend to do. Uh, and in terms of cooperation, I mentioned that we already have got that cooperation uh, with our American colleagues. Um, I would say that the pro I mean, if you look at the strategies, they're very much alike, despite our differences as to, for example, what an international standard is. Uh, we've got a different concept of that, but that does not prevent cooperating in practice, uh, even if at the end of the day, uh, the implementation might might be a bit uh, different according to each other system. The idea is not that our systems will be fully aligned because I think experience has shown both with the uh, TTIP or whatever, the uh, uh, previous attempts that it's extremely difficult to align two differences that are phys that are completely different, but at least uh, there should not be an obstacle in order to have some concrete uh, technical solutions, even if they have to be translated in a different way in our respective systems. Yes, uh, thank you very much, Gwen. And uh, I think uh, perhaps uh, when it comes to learning from each other, uh, there's only one, uh, already one thing that perhaps the EU can learn from the US, because you were talking about having a younger and more female community. and. Uh, and uh, as you saw, I got a bit confused with my papers, but I did actually forget to invite Janie Morrow, uh, who, uh, Dr. Janie Morrow, uh, to come. To please come join us on the panel now, because not only is Laurie Locascio the director of the National Institute of Standards and Technology in the United States, but Janie was, as she said, uh, just came back from Geneva, where she discussed uh, the U.S. strategy with. Um, partners around the globe and now we are lucky to have her here to discuss uh, standards with us and please bear with me <laughs> for the confusion at the beginning um, yes uh, that's good and now we're breaking it down from the eu level perhaps to the uh, to the national level or the eu member uh, level at least here in germany so um, thomas zielke who heads uh, he is the director of, of for the office of national and international standardization policy uh, can give us a glimpse into what uh, germany is doing of course you're aligning i assume with the e eu strategy but you also have your own strategy process, a forum of which Knut is a member. So um, what what is this uh, process actually about in Germany and where do you want to, what are the questions that, are you are, that you're asking and where are you heading with your, um, with your procedure? Yeah, um, thank you and uh, thank you for having me. Um, I'm uh, very uh, glad that uh, we have this topic at all on the agenda because I think almost no one is aware that we are surrounded by standards of all kinds. So sitting on a chair means standardization. Uh, having a light in a room is standardization, and the communication technologies are standardization. So that's why we have around uh, 10,000 standards from the International Electronic Commission. We have 20,000 standards from the International Standardization Organizations, and we have 30,000 standards from the German Standard Organization. And that does not mean that we do national thing. Uh, but we are a very old uh, standardization nation, and that's why we are heavily involved in that uh, process. And I'm um, glad that I can do this on the European level as well as a um, representative for the EU Committee on Standards or in the EU Committee on Standards. 
and co-chair um, of the German-Chinese uh, Committee on Standards, and uh, of course within that forum that you just mentioned. And now we have decided not to have a strategy as such in, in Germany, um, complying to what is going on uh, on the European level. Um, we had recently our uh, annual US-German Standards Panel in Washington, D.C., so uh, I joined there earlier when I, I, I served as a director for the BDI, the German Federal Industries, uh, Industry Federation uh, in Washington. So I, I can say standards play a big role in trade policy as well. And that's why we do uh, um, focus on, on uh, the importance of standards for trade, um, to facilitate trade in certain respects. And uh, we do have any reason for that, uh, because uh, the new technologies um, have really changed the world of standards rapidly. So AI, for example, is something that uh, requires uh, to have standards in real time. And that was not the case in the past. In the past, you looked at the existing technologies and the standardization organizers, uh, and uh, the more than 30,000 uh, experts were just writing the standards as a state-of-the-art technical solution, and that's it. Now we have a completely new situation, and that's why we try to react on this. We do not have a written standardization concept anymore right now, but we do this in a joint committee, which is called the National Standardization uh, Forum. And uh, so that's where we uh, try to mirror what's going on on the EU level and to bring in our own experience. Um, and to determine what types of standards we would need in the future. And that's uh, a group that is uh, consistent of a lot of experts from uh, the uh, economy, from the business community, from uh, the administration, and of course from science. Uh, we have started with that uh, just recently, and I hope, I really hope that we can come to solutions and uh, uh, try to give some impact in the standardization world. Um, I will not refer now to the details, but it's, of course, about green technologies. Uh, we have recently uh, um, the circular economy roadmap um, that uh, requires all types of new standards for uh, green technologies, uh, the digitization of uh, standards and certain government questions, governance questions as well. So leave it like that, and thank you. Yeah, just one follow-up question, because um, for somebody who's not into standards, uh, um, it's, it's, it's really interesting to see how everybody seems to be building standardization strategies now. And uh, I think, uh, so these DEAN norms and all these industrial standards that have always been around, I think, well, we haven't really seen them, and suddenly it's in the news. Uh, the U.S. is building a standard strategy, the EU, Germany. And I think there was, uh, was it Werner von Siemens who said, if you have the standard, you have the market. And I think that's uh, perhaps something that defines the old uh, German industry very well. And um, so, so why does everybody build these standardization strategies uh, suddenly? Is it because you woke up and uh, some other countries uh, came up with, uh, started to set the standards? Are you worried, are the EU, the US, Germany worried about not having the standard and the, hence not having the market? Yeah, I, I would, that's a very good question. I, I would guess there are uh, two, two different answers on that. One, one of them is a techno uh, technological development right now, uh, which, as I said, uh, requires new set of standards for, for our kind of interfaces and interoperability uh, between digital world and uh, meaning the shop floor uh, and the office floor in industry. So the Industry 4.0 or I, IoT, um, has required uh, the focus on standards and uh, uh, to implement these uh, new type of technologies uh, really need uh, to focus much more on standards than it was uh, uh, true before. The second one is the geopolitical issue of decoupling uh, from the different parts of the world. That is a certain tendency um, that came up uh, using standards sometimes as a protectionism measure uh, and working with standards or against standards uh, or with certification uh, patterns. Then you must see and acknowledge that uh, certification of an imported good needs tests and those tests uh, again require standards. So how to do the test, how to perform the test and things like that. So with that uh, you can very easily uh, build up uh, new obstacles for trade, and I, th I think that makes it very, very much important. 
Thank you very much. Nigel, you've been a, um, and I'm sorry, <laughs> I was throwing my, uh, around my papers before, but you've been a very, uh, well, uh, an, an observer with a keen eye on the, um, uh, on the specifics of standardization strategies, both in the EU and the US. And uh, now we've heard the official view a little bit, where everybody said, oh, we need to cooperate. Um, our standards need to converge. We need to do this in a way uh, that it benefits all of us. Um, so, but you've looked at these standardization strategies. Do they live up to what you've just heard, to what the officials say they want to achieve? Or do you think more cooperation is needed? Or are there some pitfalls, either for innovation, but also for, um, well, international trade, when you look at these uh, different standardization strategies around the world? Uh most definitely. Um, and firstly, thanks for being here. It's really great uh, to attend. I wish I could be there in person, given I see on the program that beer and pretzels will follow at the end of today. Um, and uh, to hear from Laurie and Gwen and others on standards, uh, which, it, I mean, like us all, I've been speaking more and more about and writing more and more about over the last um, uh, few weeks in particular. Uh, but I think there's definitely more that the, uh, Europe and the United States could do on standards and what we've seen at the Trade and Technology Council, I think is, I suppose, I would hope to be sort of the, the first steps to, to along that path. I think there's still a long way they can go before they sort of truly uh, have a sub sub substantive agenda of cooperation. Um, but I think what they've announced thus far, most recently following the meeting in Sweden on um, AI, on uh, additive manufacturing, on EV charging standards is, is a promising first set of steps, um, but that hopefully that uh, is built on through the engagement they've had, uh, building the understanding between their respective systems and where they're each going under their respective strategies, uh, so that there's more to be done. Uh, and uh, there's one particular area, well, there's a few particular issues and ideas I have where they could do that. Um, and I think it's obviously central to both uh, the respective strategies in the United States and Europe, and, and that's vis-a-vis -vis the China question. And perhaps as the, the think tank representative here, I can be a little more frank uh, and clear about that because it's obviously uh, a guiding motivation, um, as it felt my fellow panelists has mentioned in terms of the geopolitical uh, nature of this. Uh, and that standards have always been there, but they're a critical component to innovation and trade, but they've obviously been elevated to the, sort of the top of the agenda, um, in part because of growing Chinese participation uh, and engagement at standards development organisations, and particularly uh, the fact that they've taken on more leadership roles, uh, especially at the Inter uh, International Telecommunications Union. And But what each standard strategy has done in reaction to that is similar but slightly different. Um, and I think it was really interesting to hear Laurie's remarks uh, and, and her interpretation of, of the job that's been given to her, highlighting the fact that it's not about exclusion of any particular uh, participants from any particular country. It's a matter of supporting the system uh, that produces international standards, which by and large works perfectly fine to the point where, as my fellow panelists said, no one really even notices they're there. Uh, but now that we do notice they're there, um, what do we do about those legitimate concerns about Chinese participation? And it's about, I think, reinforcing the core principles as exhibited by the World Trade Organization uh, as uh, uh, technical barriers to trade on, on what makes a good standard system in terms of consensus-based decision-making, voluntary, open and such, uh, reinforcing that, but then also reinforcing the enabling factors that, that lead to what I call standardization power. And, and we've spoken about that in terms of uh, a standardization um, savvy workforce, um, embedding standards in relevant grants and government programs so that as uh, Europe or the United States invest more in supporting innovation in particular sectors, that, that standards is a part of the program to help uh, develop the, the pool of experts you need to engage in standards, uh, and also ensuring sort of broad and ongoing participation in standards, whether it's industry or academia or others, um, more can be done there to support, uh, I suppose, a healthy, engaged standard system. And so I think in that regards, um, there's a lot more they can be doing. And then it's a matter of once they get familiar enough with each other, expanding that to Japan, Singapore, Australia and other 
uh, countries who are similarly concerned about, about where the standard system may be going and drawing them in to sort of a, as a part of a coordinated fashion um, and to, to, on where to go. I think one area where the US standard, uh, US strategy mentions, as well as Europe does, that they can do much more is just on basic information sharing. And the TTC has already announced this, but I think there's still a lot more that can be done there because, as I mentioned, standard system has done well. It's a matter of identifying where there are concerns, and that requires information sharing, particularly with private sector representatives, to understand what is going on where and why, and where there are concerns to be addressed there. But anyway, I'll leave it at that end and look forward to a following discussion. Yes, uh, thank you um, very much, Nigel, for these insights. And before, because so we are already in the midst of the cooperation um, discussion, but I think before I go on with this, um, I, I want to call on you, Knut, because um, I think in the two previous discussions, most of us could follow, right? We, we sort of understand that, that with subsidies or tax breaks, you can promote certain technologies that uh, you can either use the demand side to develop technologies or you uh, invest in R&D and really try to develop something completely new. But now we've heard a lot, standards are important for innovation. They're not a barrier for innovation. On the contrary, they're supposed to promote innovation. How do they do that? Perhaps you can give us an introduction as a professor of innovation focusing on, on standardization. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you also for the invitation and, and organizing kind of this specific panel because standardization was for a long time not really uh, well, well recognized. And, and it's probably much more difficult than just spending money uh, for r and or, or, or for some specific tax schemes. It means uh, that's, uh, that's also a little bit the, the, yeah, the challenge to, to really sell this as, a, as an effective and important policy instrument. And uh, regarding it, uh, to innovation, uh, which is uh, yeah, also my, uh, I think even a little more than uh, my hobby horse, uh, there, are, there are different, different aspects to, co to consider. Uh, um, the first standards are certainly a knowledge pool, yeah, like like scientific publications, uh, sci uh, like like patents, and we know from the, the the German innovation panel that that they are really considered much more than than these other sources, especially for for innovators. Then, uh, yeah, all the the products in in the IT world have, have to be kind of interoperable or, or compatible, otherwise they are not really making it. Uh, successfully to do the market, especially to take to really realize a takeoff uh, to a level which which really then uh, creates a viable business model beyond that. Uh, otherwise, you have some kind of silo uh, solutions nobody is interested uh, in. Uh, therefore, this this is key um, um, and and not so easy uh, always to achieve because there are also maybe patents around which which might might prohibit this this open access then the standards can create trust uh, especially in, in new and and maybe also risky technologies and products um, and and here um, if if the, the the pioneering user is really kind of yeah, trusting that the, the company is, is implementing the standards in the right way, maybe also connected with some certification scheme. That's, that's certainly uh, another point. And then very kind of very basic economics. If you have standards, you can realize economies of scale. That means you can get into mass production, and and that's that's certainly a good thing. Uh, recently, a new argument came up: is standards can also hedge risk. That means um, uh, if you're doing in parallel own R and D, you can always kind of if these standards are open. And, and accessible for everybody, you can really kind of fall back on them if, if maybe your own R&D activity is, is, is maybe not successful. And, and these are some, some examples why standards might be, might be positive uh, for innovation. Certainly, they can also create lock-ins into kind of old and then meanwhile even faster outdated technologies and therefore one, one has to really keep them up, up to date and therefore the link to research is, is certainly key. And uh, this is also a tradition we have uh, at the European level, but also at the national level. And by the way, Germany had a, at least a, a strategy paper on standardization, I think, already out in 2009, therefore. Uh, but I really appreciate that we have now this European and, and also the US document, which 
We also have to attract students. Uh, that means the generation of, of uh, uh, which has to take over then uh, the, the burden because we, we see here, and this has been mentioned by previous speakers, uh, also a big demand um, that we have to uh, get the young people uh, uh, interested into the topics. And by the way, um, in, in our course in station, I think we have more females than males. Therefore, we, we see already here a little bit of the switch uh, to it. Uh, but it's very complicated, this innovation topic, because uh, here intellectual property rights play an important role. And here again, uh, China is, is uh, playing, uh, especially in some area, a very, very dominant role, and uh, and uh, in combination with their their strong presence in international standardization bodies, um, this is certainly challenging the the old kind of distribution of of power. Therefore, we have to kind of rebalance this in a way that uh, we might get a, a sustainable kind of yeah, collaborative uh, atmosphere, which which really takes all players. Uh, but also maybe new players, uh, maybe from the global south, on board. Yeah, that's that's also quite keen and uh, key, and and therefore uh, also to address the topic in the morning. We we're talking about climate change standards can also here help because we have not really global regulations, yeah, and uh, uh, but we have international standards uh, which which. Uh, are kind of supported and endorsed by the, the big community of, of countries uh, involved in ISO, IEC and ITU. Thank you very much, Knut. And, and Jenny, I want to... Um, I, that was a good introduction, actually, into the nexus between, uh, <laughs> between uh, standards and innovation. But it made me also think, uh, coming back to something that uh, your director said, uh, Jenny, well, two things. One was... Um, one was about the fact that uh, standards are a bottom-up process in the United States, and I think they're also in, 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 in other countries. And then this idea, if you have the standard, uh, you have the market. I'm old enough to remember that at the time, software had to be IBM compatible <laughs> at some time. Uh, and so my question here is, uh, do we talk a lot about collaborating, cooperating, etc.? But from a, from a firm level perspective, or even a country perspective, is there an incentive really to cooperate? Or is it not like a race and you really want to set the standards and then everybody has to align with your products? What's, what's the rationale for saying, well, we really have to work together to, to align? Sure, thank you. And thank you for the opportunity to be here and have this discussion with all of you and follow um, our director who I greatly admire and she's a, a powerful voice for standards and innovation not only in the United States but, but globally and has, has created a number of documentary standards over the course of her career as have I. And I just want to correct a couple of things before I answer your question. One is um, the U.S. government's national standard strategy for critical and emerging technology is in itself a new document, but it is bolstering support for the national standard strategy, which has been in, in existence a long time and just republished by the American National Standards Institute in 2020, and, and that's a, a very long-term dedicated process. So I want to try to just guide the conversation and that the U.S. government's approach is a very narrow sliver of a very big pie. And part of the reason that this activity is happening, as our director articulated, is that we really need to work more closely with international partners and across the U.S. government to be able to be effective in critical and emerging technology spaces as our industry sectors evolve and part of it is and I think this goes to your question of why would we join a standards table um, if you look at these emerging technologies it doesn't do our societies any good if we're doing this work in a stovepipe we have to be able to look across uh, a global community of need and the industries are looking at a global community of need and the technologies are developed by our global industry so I think in and looking at that system uh, it we really aren't aren't serving our populace well if we're not working collaboratively across uh, around the globe uh, in those engagements. And in the terms of the bottoms-up activity as it works in the United States, industry 
is doing not only the research and development, but leaning heavily into the critical findings and intellectual property, and those become small businesses, and they join the standards table as well. So it's really meant to create a space for building consensus and fostering a common expectation of what a technology should be able to achieve. And in most of my standard setting experience, when it's, it's you're not setting in terms of a standard, you're not saying, well, at least in terms of a technical standard that I'm referring to, you're not setting the emissions level. What you're setting is the ability to measure that emissions level with a certain technology. And I think that's a really important distinction for this conversation in that we all need tools to solve our problems. And we need to know that those tools work well in our hands. And if we don't have standards, we can't answer those questions because what might work well in your hand may not work well in mine. And it's because we just didn't demonstrate it or you're in Germany and I'm in the United States. And so we need to have these common methods of comparability. We need to have common baselining um, level playing field approaches uh, to how we look at technologies and how to apply them. And that's really where standards are very helpful. So, Thank you very Thank much, you. Uh, Janie, for this uh, additional uh, explanation. And perhaps I, I, I want to, well, play this back to the EU Commission uh, a little bit, uh, because in the session before we discussed industrial policies and uh, uh, looked at some OECD work that was trying to measure industrial policies. So in terms of standards, uh, Janie just uh, pointed out very eloquently that it's about well, having the right tools to, to measure uh, uh, things like emissions, etc. And of course, in the, it, it's very uh, clear that uh, uh, there you need a sort of um, um, an international agreement on methods, how to do this in order to uh, then uh, take it further. So what's the right uh, setting to, to have these talks? Where do you have these talks? And do, would you need international organizations to help perhaps a little bit more in developing these tools or at least in defining standards for these tools so everybody is working with the same tools and can um, well, converge on a, on a common understanding of uh, how standards uh, should work, technical standards? Uh, yeah, I think we we have the we have the organizations that can do that with ISO, IC. Uh, Nigel was mentioning ITU. I mean, the the international organizations exist. Uh, the, if there's a need, everybody can come there. And actually, that's what we agreed to do with our American colleagues. If we see positive priorities that we would like to push, uh, that we see as priorities for international standardization, uh, one side will contact the other and see whether there's a, an interest on the other side of the Atlantic. And if there's a, a mutual interest, we can push together in order to uh, put that priority at the, at the international agenda. <laughs> so that's something we've actually agreed within the TTC, uh, what I call the F offensive part. There's also a defensive part, which is a, another one. If there are undesired initiatives uh, by other partners that uh, one side can alert the other if there's a, a, a common concern that we can actually react uh, in a joint in a joint effort but i think the organization is there the question is basically uh, the identification of needs sharing with uh, like-minded partners whether we've got an interest in putting it on the agenda of the international um, on the international uh, organ standardization organization concern what other organizations could help us is actually motivate other partners. Uh, I think it was uh, um, Knut who was mentioning the Global South, I mean, actually to encourage the participation of countries that might not be uh, as active as the, Europe, the EU or the US or Japan uh, today in international standardization. We're doing our bit as far as the EU is concerned. Uh, we've got programs for uh, uh, for uh, improving the quality infrastructure, as we call it, in uh, African countries, for example, the quality infrastructure being standardization, conformity assessment, metrology, etc. So the whole system. But every effort that could be done in that in that idea of uh, promoting the participation of more partners uh, in the, in uh, international standardization activity uh, it would be welcome. But I think the the, the the, if you want, the, the, the structure is there. It's just that uh, 
is, is just to use the structure to the best and uh, promote the, the participation of, uh, of uh, the widest possible community. Thank you, Gwen. Just a follow-up. So, because you said it's important uh, also to reach agreement upon like-minded uh, partners, and I suppose that could be the EU and the US. So, if there's more convergence, a better um, common understanding of what standards for these emerging technologies uh, should look like, does that make you stronger uh, jointly in order to speak with partners who uh, perhaps took some different routes? Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, I've seen that in practice in the automotive sector, for example, in UNEC, which is not exactly the same setup for standards, standards but uh, uh, it's clear that when uh, you 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 join you join agenda priorities and you come together saying we need we need to work uh, on the global level on that type of uh, uh, standard standard family or. Uh, then you are of course stronger than we you go with one voice. I mean that's the, by the way it's the the whole EU philosophy that being 27 member states we are stronger than each member state in its corner. So that's also true when we when we go to at, at the international level. Uh, this actually should I mean doesn't contradict what I said earlier that we've got different systems and that should be taken into account. It's not to change the systems that we have. Uh, for example, with Japan, our system is very much aligned. So, I mean, it's uh, it's even more natural. Uh, but uh, EU, US, uh, we we generally uh, are very aligned as far as the priorities for work and standardization are concerned. Even if translating it in our respective national systems might be a bit different. But uh, I mean, it doesn't prevent us working together on international priorities. Thank you. Nigel, if you had to uh, mention just one element, uh, either of the EU, uh, well, the e uh, US or the EU strategy, where uh, uh, well, these countries' blocks should work on in order to, uh, well, to move forward better, to also promote uh, green um, uh, technologies better, but also to, to gain a common understanding with which they can um, uh, promote um, uh, international standards globally, what would it be? What should they work on? Well, well, one key idea and then one, I suppose, cautionary tale of why they need to do it. Um, building on points that Jane mentioned, and it's something that Gwen and, and his counterparts in the US are already working on, but I think there's an, a lot more they could do on pre-standardisation cooperation, which is essentially metrology. It's the measurement of uh the, the the issues involved use cases terminologies and such and so that regardless of how each country uh enacts laws and regulations on ai or something they're built on a common foundation of terminology measurement and such uh such as on bias and ai bias or ai accountability whatever it may be if you can draw folks together early enough so that even as they go off and develop the technologies and, and then build laws and regulations on top of it, they're built on common foundations. And it's even more obscure and, and unrecognized uh, beyond technical standards, but the EU and US have done this already in a number of areas. Um, back in the 80s and 90s on nanomaterials and medical health issues and such. So there's actually uh, a track record for this type of cooperation, but it's identifying specific technologies or issues and drawing together the right private public sector folks uh, on those issues early enough so that then their respective systems sort of uh, move in parallel off a similar foundation. And so I think that uh, there's a lot more to be done, but it's, it takes a lot of proactive sort of thoughtful engagement and awareness on who is doing what, because um, it, this is largely done by the private sector in terms of these technologies and drawing them in providing them with the guidance of like, hey, as policymakers, this is the public, our public policy interest in these technologies. Can you guys work together to make sure you, you have those foundational points in place? The cautionary tale of why this is important for sort of the green transition um, stems from uh, a recent example where the US sort of misstepped in that there are some US national security officials who view technical standards as an adversarial zero sum competition with China and that where China wins, the US loses, and, and haven't taken into account the second and third order effects of sanctions against Chinese entities as it relates to standards. And so when the US sanctioned Huawei, 
Uh, it didn't provide a clear and broad enough exemption for their standards engagement, um, such as for the boring but critical standard or benchmarking tool involved in the energy efficiency of servers. China was previously involved in the one global standard that was involved in this. This is obviously a critical part in ensuring sort of digitalization happens in a more uh, climate friendly way. Um, they were involved in this, they were using this, they were in the process of adopting this at home. But with that sanctioned entity, um, the global standard essentially had to eject their Chinese members for fear of breaching US sanctions law. China, Huawei and others went home to the Chinese government and set up a duplicative an objectively uh, less ambitious uh, standard for managing uh, for measuring the energy efficiency of servers. And it's now mandatory to use in China, which is a large part of the global market. And now they're advocating Europe to also reference its standard alongside this other global standard, the Green Grid Spec Cert standard. The Biden administration has fixed this issue only recently, but it took them two years to do so. And in that period, we now have two standards on the energy efficiency of servers. And so that's a problematic example whereby increasing focus on China's engagement and on technical standards don't marry up and aren't done in a nuanced and targeted manner that will have a direct impact on a critical technology involved in, in sort of the green transition. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, Perhaps um, after this, I'm going to pick up on some questions from the audience. And by the way, you are invited to ask questions as well. Uh, but uh, Thomas Zielke, just uh, does this idea resonate with you that uh, there are some areas where um, in pre-standardization where the US and uh, or where countries could collaborate better, that uh, get together earlier in order to uh, to converge uh, before it's too late. That's uh, how, sort of how I understand uh, the argument. As a non-expert, you would oh, well, Thanks. One is enough. Um, okay. Thank you. Um, yes. Yes and no at the same time. Frankly. Um, so we have, uh, we have for a long time uh, reached out to several countries uh, for bilateral cooperation uh, <clears throat> right in the pre-standardization sector and spreading the news that consensual standards on an international level is the best way of creating standards. Uh, we have a program which is called, uh, uh, which is, uh, called Global uh, um, Program for Quality Infrastructure. We do this together with Brazil, with uh, Mexico, with China, with India and as I mentioned, uh, and in Indonesia. And we have also, uh, of course, our standing committees with the uh, United States, uh, which is very clear. Um, so in some respects, so when it comes to overall uh, fundamental questions of humanity, for example, we, uh, that what the G7 did under the German presidency last year, uh, so we agreed on a certain text, for example, that uh, standards should uh, also um, apply and uh, when uh, human rights are touched. Uh, so that is a very fundamental principle, for example, in data protection and privacy protection and other issues. And I think it, it makes sense uh, to agree on this in the pre-standardization world. On the other hand, we have certain uh, technical developments that even as a state, and even if you have powerful uh, companies, you cannot influence completely. And, and that are the consortia that have been built up uh, in the IT world recently and in recent years or decades uh, where the standards have been set uh, among a, a, a small number, comparatively small number of companies uh, uh, free from influence from elsewhere. And just that is market driven, I admit that, uh, which is fine. Um, but uh, it is out of the system of consensual standards. And uh, now we have to talk about these core principles, uh, which um, as a government, uh, we clearly are in favor of the consensual uh, system. And that is another point where we have, to, uh, we have to point on that this system would also give opportunities to developing countries uh, to be a part of it, uh, to uh, take part in standardization and to also uh, be a standard uh, a standard maker instead of being a standard taker. So I, I would uh, I sum up that in, in the overall principle related question, it is very important uh, to, uh, to address these uh, questions like the ethics of artificial intelligence, for example, uh, I think where we have uh, interesting thoughts from the United States, uh, which should, we should take up and, and uh, also consider in the standardization work which is done uh, from the private sector. 
Yeah, thank you very much. I think that's something I, I would like to, to discuss with you as well, Janie, market-driven versus this consensual aspect. Uh, the United States, of course, is a country that where the market, uh, well, it plays a big role, uh, has uh, contributed a lot to the uh, wealth uh, of the country. Is that something, and you, is that something, w would you agree with Thomas, that even though standards may effectively be set by uh, a single uh, entity or a single firm, is it important to uh, still sit around the table uh, to find consensus, and is it important also to involve uh, countries from the global south? Uh, so they can have a say, in particular with things like AI that is on everybody's mind now and where we're really worried about where the machine's taking over. Uh, how important is it to, to have international cooperation on this and, and, uh, and cooperation between the private sector and the state, of course? Thank you, and thank you for the question. I, as you alluded to earlier, I just uh, returned from Geneva where I presented a statement on the floor of the World Trade Organization's technical, um, the Committee on Technical Barriers to Trade where the, the principles, the key principles of our standards development system, which is global, and those key principles were developed by the TBT Committee and uh, adopted, and uh, if there's concern regarding the impact of standards on uh, a country's ability to have effective trade in that global marketplace, that is where that would be discussed. And so in that body, I had the opportunity to um, double down on the U.S.'s intent of commitment to these principles and furthering the work of international standards development in this global system and encouraging others to come to the table as part of that conversation. And uh, the, the TBT committee already has efforts to help train and engage uh, uh, c communities, uh, countries from all around the world on how to embrace what we've all adopted as our global trade uh, capacity. So in listening in that discussion and having that opportunity, I think it's one of hopefully will be many ways in which we can reach out across the global community and, and encourage people, as our, our director said just a few moments ago, encourage us all to sustain those commitments and think about standards activities and also challenge organizations. One of the things that the United States U.S. government strategy says is that we need to work closely together to look at governance models and make sure that they're reinforcing. These are governance for standards development activities, that these models are reinforcing the TBT principles and being clear about that. And if they're not, then we have to challenge whether or not we accept that as a standard. And I think that's a global community responsibility. It's not just the United States. And then lastly, I just wanted to follow up on the comments around uh, pre-standardization research. A large part of my career was in metrology, and I believe heavily in the role of our ability to compare measurements and develop those measurements in consensus standards development processes that practice these global principles. I know that sounds like a lot, but it's it's a fairly open, uh, straightforward community to work in, and uh, we're welcoming everyone to that table and having come from that world and have done a lot of uh, standards development, especially in ASTM International, where I worked on standards for biological threat response, and in that place, we all need to be concerned about what we can measure for sure and be able to compare that. So I believe heavily, heavily on that system and really rely on uh, that global comparability and how I look at standards developmentedness. So thank you. Thank you very much, Janie. And I have a question uh, for you, Gwen, from the audience, from the United States. Uh, Brian Kahin is asking um, that, uh, so he says uh, some, there has been some tension between the US and the EU over standard strategies because uh, uh, the EU gave some uh, priority to CNN and CNELEC, CN CNELEC. Uh, rather than um, Etsy, which is uh, which seems to be well, which is more international, uh, the, despite its name. So now this is very um, really a question for experts. But uh, he's asking whether this issue has been resolved. Okay, that's 
sorry for that. We've got the police here. Um, so they're not coming for me at least. That's them. That's the, that's them. But um, no, the, I mean, it, it fits with the previous discussion, actually. Uh, just to give the framework and colleagues like Thomas would know that perfectly well. But I mean, I think it's worth re reminding. We've got three or European standardization organizations, SEN, SENELEC, ETSI. So the three are European standardization organizations. So it's not a question of, of uh, have, uh, like love, loving one, uh, not loving the other. We've got three European standardization organizations and basically uh, they've got a special status in the sense that for uh, policy priorities and for standards, which we call in Europe harmonized standards, which are supporting European legislation in the sense that if you apply the standard, you're given the presumption of conformity to the European uh, legislation concerned. Uh, they have a sort of delegation from the public, uh, from the public authority. They are given a monopoly actually to produce these harmonized standards, which are very much aligned with international standards most of the time. Uh, developed in ISO, IAC, ITU. So basically, uh, our approach, and that was what Thomas was mentioning in terms of the debate market driven versus consensus, actually, what we like is, is of course, it's market driven in the sense that it's bottom up. We don't have the intention as a public service to produce standards ourselves. But, more, but bottom up doesn't mean big industry only. It also means SMEs, it means involvement of, of, of unions, of consumers, of NGOs, etc. So that's where the difference for us, and that's why we like, we tend to like the national delegation principle, which ensures the participation of all stakeholders in, this, in the development of standards. Uh, this is with that in mind, actually, that with the following the European strategy, which we have announced for some governance uh, reform, we actually make sure now that everybody can continue participating in development of standards within the EU. But for this type of standards that are actually uh, corresponding to our policy priorities and giving presumption of conformity to our legislation, which are basically quasi low for those we actually give the, the, the monopoly of the decision at the important decision steps to national standardization bodies, ensuring that basically the European national standardization bodies and the European stakeholders have got a say because we cannot be in the situation in which we were, where basically in certain organizations, the more you pay, the more you voting rights you've got, and then you finish with having European standardization organizations where non-European or, or, uh, companies have got more votes than the Europeans themselves uh, for something which is, I remind, quasi-European law. So that's also a question of, uh, uh, I mean, that doesn't happen in the US and that doesn't happen in, in China. So that's also something where we had to put some order. Uh, perhaps one dimension that was not mentioned that I would like to 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 point out as well is that there's an beyond this uh, market driven versus consensus. There's another dimension, and AI, for example, will be one of the elements. But uh, more generally, it concerns the values and uh, fundamental principles and fundamental rights. Uh, there is a need as well to be clear and to be perhaps a, a bigger need now to be clear and what has to be dealt by the legislation which is defined democratically by our uh, elected people and standards. Uh, not everything can be put in the standards and some choices have to be made at the legislation level by our democratically elected representatives. And that's very important to have this distinction clear in your mind because it will so it will rapidly it would really rapidly become unacceptable if within the standards you people start dealing with things that have to be democratically decided. Thank you very much. It, can I to, to briefly just jump in um, to provide some pushback, but then some some support? Uh, Gwen's final point there is the right one, it is a critical component in our discussions about technical standards in not overloading standards with issues that they were never designed to be to be used for in terms of addressing issues around values and such that are clearly the prerogative of laws and regulations. I think, and that's a critical point to, 
but all of us policymakers looking at technical standards, understanding their role clearly and what they can and can't do. The second point, I would push back though on Gwen's point in that recent changes to how Europe makes standards has, has closed down open participation where there was once participation. Uh, putting aside his concerns about the Etsy voting model in that uh, we've seen, and we've seen this embedded in various pieces of vertical legislation with the AI Act and Data Act, the EU cloud cybersecurity scheme, such that uh, what was once a more open system for outside participants to play a role in the setting of uh, central European standards, that's no longer the case. And that's, that's a problematic trend we've seen evolve during the course of the Trade and Technology Council. But I see he's going to, that he has a point in, in rebuttal. May I just so react? It, it I mean, gets... nothing has changed as far as participation in standard development is concerned. It's about the, the, the elements at certain important decision steps where the decision making it, might be limited to European stakeholders. But the participation, nothing has changed in the, the, the work for developing standards. That's definitely, I think, a point that uh, we might want to follow up on bilaterally. We are almost ran out of time, but I do want to, with Knut, with you, link back per, a little bit to the discussion we had before on whether, um, you know, R&D should be supported or uh, there should be more uh, demand-side instruments to really make sure that green technologies are being deployed. And my question to, uh, to you is, um, how Im I would think that standards and, and and an international agreement on standards will be very important if you use this type of demand side um demand side instrument where you say, I don't know, a certain uh, quota of cement will have to be green or uh, produced with whatever, green hydro, what is green hydrogen, etc. So how important are standards in this green transition, which is really uh, the subject of our conference today? I think that they, they are undervalued so far. Um, we, we have only talking about yeah, RD subsidies and tax tax breaks and, and incentives. Um, there is already, regarding the demand side, there is already the option to reference the index in, in public procurement. That means there is a direct link between demand side policies like public procurement and standards, and there, there are also rules at the European level how, how to do that in a, in a proper way. But to really address the, the big challenges of, of green transition, especially related to, to climate, uh, I think international standards uh, uh, have to play a key role because um, we have Paris agreements and other um, yeah, regulation-like um, the kind of mechanisms, but we had uh, the discussion in the morning that uh, the, 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 the pressure really to implement all these uh, agreements uh, are, are limited and therefore uh, international standards should come in and uh, hopefully soon I, I can share a document with some, uh, some interesting uh, maybe new ideas how to really exploit their power even more at the global level to uh, maybe at the end help to address uh, the, the big challenges of climate change and other uh, transition issues. Yes, uh, thank you very much. Um, please uh, join me in thanking the panel of, uh, for introducing us into the world of standardization. It's important for the green transition and also importance of cooperation. Thank you very much. Thank you also, Gwen and Nigel, for joining us digitally. It was uh, very instructive. And now um, I can finally give you 15 minutes to have uh, some water, coffee again, and uh, mingle.